Hello and good morning. Um, first, a few words. Today is about, uh, my talk today is about raising the bar. I like to look outside software development and see what we can learn from other domains. And this is what it will, uh, we'll explore together. Uh, please don't expect a lot of answers. This is a different type of talk that I usually do. Usually I do a lot of code and showing a lot of different solutions uh, to specific problems, but today is more about exploration. It's more about opening up possibilities. Um, and just as a quick disclaimer, I got a call last night, so I may be a bit fuzzy, uh, but I'll try my best to, to be uh, in the best shape possible. Um, so raising the bar. Uh, it's been 10 years since the Software Craftsmanship Manifesto, and when I, when I first learned about it, uh, it was the most interesting part for me was uh, the raising the bar uh, sentence. And um, my journey started uh, when I met uh, Corey Haynes. Um, he introduced us to he came to Romania, he introduced us to uh, software craftsmanship and code retreats. And then I started doing the first code retreat outside the US, many more code retreats around Europe, and many travels to European conferences and communities. But then what was interesting is my brother started this thing, which is, we call it the soft dev gang. It's very hard to define because the only definition we can give is there are a few people who already know about test-driven developer refactoring and so on. We don't discuss those things, but instead we try to explore other things. But what are we trying to explore is very fuzzy. So nobody, if you ask more people in the group what it's about, they will tell you different things, probably. And that's an interesting thing. Uh, now the reason I was interested in exploring outside the box is, uh, I was born and raised in communist Romania, and uh, back then it was a fairly totalitarian controlled society, but there were different things that you could use to evade, uh, and one of them was sci-fi. And after 89, uh, there was an explosion of sci-fi books after our revolution. And this is one of my favorites, but there are many, many others. Um, and if you read Dune, you'll see that it's, you'll remember that it's about a lot of things. It's about history, it's about ecology, it's about systems, it's about politics, it's about religion. It's an amazing book, and it's amazing how short it is for <laughs> how, how much it achieves. Um, so that's why, based on my background, I looked at raising the bar and said, okay, this is interesting. So what I want to do now, when I heard about software craftsmanship first was, let's go into communities. Let's work together, let's practice. Um, I wanted to learn from other people. I wanted to help other people learn. Uh, and I was glad to see this happening and I'm glad to see this is still happening now. But 10 years later, I can't stop thinking that maybe we can do more than that. Uh, there's much more than you know, the practices that we are discussing. They are very good. But how about going further? Uh, so it's about innovation. It's about breaking silos. It's about looking outside our little things, which I know sometimes can be very overwhelming because we have deadlines and we need to learn stuff. And it seems there's a lot of things to learn. But then again, there's also a lot of passion in people to, to learn other things. And I'm very surprised to hear uh, nowadays the, the other side of the coin. When I talk to people and they tell me, I don't want to hear about Agile, I'm just about software craftsmanship. I'm doing DevOps, not Agile, and so on. This doesn't make any sense. But these are labels that we put to ourselves, and we forget that all these things are connected. And you probably, I'm in London, so I would expect this to be a well-known show. It's one of my favorite uh, series on, from BBC, it's called Connections. 
It's about the history of innovation going through ages, and it connects uh, things like you know the the invention of nuclear missiles with uh, the invention of screws initially, or very weird things like this. Uh, and it drags a, a, a thread through history, and it shows you how th everything is actually connected. So then, to move to the core of this issue is, the idea is what if we combine uh, other domains with software development? Where can we get? Um, and I have to tell you one thing. It's, um, I actually had another talk prepared for this conference, but then one of my friends, David Hasman, died. And it was a, uh, he was a very influential person to me and one of the out-of-the-box thinkers, so part of this talk is for him. He came up with one thing that's really, really funny and useful for... Uh, coaches everywhere, which is the value of the practices that we do depends much more on why we do them than on how we do them. And because he was known as, you know, the big Lebowski dude thing, it's called the dude's law. It's one of the original ideas that he came with. Okay, and so what I will do in the rest of the talk is to explore a number of intersections between software design and and software development in other industries. And not all of them, so some of them have practical results, some of them are just starting, some of them are just weird. Uh, and my hope is that maybe some of you will pick, maybe not these ideas, but other ideas up and, and create work groups where you can actually explore these things so that we can raise the bar. My first contribution to this was uh, software design and UX. Um, how can we do... Uh, there was a series of events that happened, uh, some of them at Socrates UK, where we ended up defining that, you know, actually, when you think about software design, about code structures, who is using that? That is one type of design. Who is using that is not the end users, it's the developers. If the developers are using that, and when I say developers, I mean in an agile sense, testers, ops, right? What if we could use UX practices to improve our designs? Would that make sense? And what are some of the UX practices that we can use? One is personas. And the example I usually give, it's, it's very different to work for Linux kernel than for uh, microservices application. There are different personas involved, so maybe we need to take into account their uh, knowledge, uh, the people's knowledge, and um, what fits them best. Another one was user journeys, and user journeys is a very interesting thing when you apply it to software design. By looking at it, we ended up with uh, something called navigability uh, smells, because what do you do as a user of software design? You need to change something in the code. And how do you do that? You need to navigate where you, you need to change. Um, and if you think about this in terms of UX, uh, if you have to do more steps, or if it takes you a long time, or if you do a lot of mistakes, that's not good experience. So what we'd like is to ideally know exactly where to change, get directly there, make the change, validate, make it work. Um, and uh, that's how we came up with a few navigability smells. And also usability tests. That's another idea. So there are many companies where I discuss with them and they tell me, you know, it takes six months for a new developer to join a team and become productive. This is not a very good uh, thing. So how can you deal with that? Well, how about testing for usability. Ask a developer who has no idea about your design to change something in your code. Look at them and see where they get stuck. And this will show the problems in, in the usability of your software design. Why is this interesting? Because usability is defined by five different um, 
characteristics, design qualities, uh, learnability, efficiency, errors, memorability. <coughs> so in and uh, satisfaction. And if you look at them from the point of view of users, of software developers, what is this? This means it's much faster to implement the common types of work. Maybe not all types of work, but the common ones. What is that? A new developer can join the team and become productive much earlier. What is mistakes? It's about reducing the number of bugs that you introduce in your code. So this is why it's a very interesting proposal that should help both programmers, managers, organizations, because why is usability such an interesting uh, and caught up so well in other domains? It caught up so well because it's a win-win-win contract. Users get better products, man, uh, product developers get users that are happy, and so on. So I believe this can help uh, uh, teams become not only more productive, but also feel better about it. And so this ended up with a book uh, where more of these things are, are detailed. But I will, not, I will stop here for now. There's, I have other talks on this topic, and, and the book is a very good source of information with, um, about usable software design. And so then I expanded my search to other design disciplines. And one of the things that has always bothered me is how do we teach programmers to be better designers? How do we get to be better designers? I was lucky I had a mentor. And every morning I would get an email saying, this is where you got things wrong. And there were 10 different things that were wrong. And I had to fix it, and it wasn't a very nice process, but it was this continuous feedback that helped me uh, get better. Um, and so my thought process has been, okay, so how do other designers learn design? Because uh, other design disciplines tend to be older than ours, so can we learn something from that? And one idea, that I, I learned is we were talking yesterday about things like design biases and the things that, you know, intuition. We come with the first idea and implement it. This is called in other design disciplines, it's called satisficing. And actually designers train to avoid it. Uh, and part of the design schools is to use these, um, what's called design studies, and this is one example from Copenhagen Design Museum, where there are probably 60 different versions of a chair. Right? They never come up with only one solution. In fact, if you ask any other designer uh, to come up with a solution, they will come up with much more than, than one. And this allows people to train more than just their intuition or basically train their intuition so that it's useful when you go in production and when you have to make a decision. But instead of making a decision based on what happened, what you happened to pick up on the road, you'll make a decision based on a deliberate exploration of solutions. And so we came up with a list that's not very complete and still a work in progress about uh, software design uh, studies. And this is just one example. Uh, this is actually something that I did uh, about 10 years ago uh, when we implemented the C++ database engine. It was a NoSQL engine before it was NoSQL. So, and what I learned from that is that it's not that scary, actually. Uh, and you can, the idea with these design studies is to pick a problem that's not as simple as a kata, but a bit more complex, and then to explore design alternatives. So don't try only one 
option. Don't get better at one solution, but instead try to spread and figure out which are five, ten different solutions to the same problem and implement them up to a level where you can get some, some input on is this good enough or not. Now, of course, this can be very time consuming. I, I understand that this is a problem we haven't fixed yet, but I think it's a promising idea. Let's go into a more strange one. Um, material science. I'm an engineer by trade. I, I still remember I didn't understand a lot in university about material science. But uh, one thing that these things come back to haunt you at some point. Um, and uh, what I realized is you can look at the code as a material for prototyping. And why I'm saying for prototyping, because I see the code as being the design. The code is the blueprint that you pass into compilers to build, to do mass production. That's, so what we are doing is actually designing. But how are we designing, like many other designers who are using a prototyping material? And in our case, this is code. And then if, if you look at this as a material, what, what type of material is it? Can we have any um, equations that describe its behavior? And I know it sounds a bit weird, but going through this idea, I, I realized that there are a few, it's not quite maybe the best naming, but there are two forces that you can apply to code. One is to change it. And basically, you plug something in the code, right? That's, that's what changes, or you move things around. And the other one is execution, where you pass in some inputs, you get some outputs. And there's a constraint of coherence. It has to work. Um, and then we have a property that's best described as mechanical, because the code gets rigid in some areas. And if you imagine this as a material, what it would mean is that it's very hard to pick it apart there, but only in certain regions, not everywhere. So to me, it sounds like it's a very weird type of plasticine, uh, where you kind of get harder uh, in, in certain parts. But then this leads to another idea. So maybe what do we have about the code? We have its structure, which is basically a kind of topology. Um, and we have coupling between various parts in the code. So maybe the rigidity distribution is just uh, some kind of integration over the code topology of the coupling function. Now, of course, we don't have any of this uh, because I have no idea how to write these equations. But it would be good to reach out to people who actually can. But one thing that is interesting to me in this exploration is maybe we could uh, imagine other ways of interacting with code. Uh, through a plasticine-like view, like more with your hands rather than with the keyboard. I have no idea where this will go, but <laughs> it's an idea that's very interesting to me. Um, number four, it's about mathematics. Uh, <coughs> sorry. So, I'll skip this. One of the reasons I like mathematics compared to software development is because of the standard of proof. There's something profoundly um, that I, I don't quite like about the standard of proof that we have in software development. Um, what we have is mostly it worked for a team, or it worked for a few people, or it worked for, and then maybe you could try this. This is the only proof we have right now. So I thought maybe we can use some, some more rig rigorosity from mathematics into maybe legacy code. What would that be? Um, and what I realized is that if you look at the at a program in general, any program can be written as a lambda. You get a bunch of inputs, you get time, and or a time series of some sort, and what you get out is outputs. 
Now we tend to overcomplicate this by mixing together, you know, the uh, file system and HTTP and all this stuff. But those are just on the edge of our lambda. Those are details in this type of thinking. And then basically what we are trying to do in software development is to decompose that, that big lambda into smaller things. This is our hypothesis. This is something that works. So then what happens when you have a problem with legacy code? The biggest problem is dependencies. That's where it's very hard to, uh, to refactor. Uh, again, the rigidity factor, uh, things that don't quite change together. And so I started experimenting with a technique where uh, I used the ugly trivia uh, code base from legacy code, uh, ref legacy code refactoring. And I started to apply this algorithm. So first, pick an area of code. Then, second step, turn it into a big, ugly lambda. Uh, third step, decompose the big, ugly lambda into smaller, nice lambdas. And fourth, you can reorganize those based on cohesion. Uh, so if you see a lot of parameters repeating between various lambdas, there may be an indicator that those are functions who want to be together in a class or in an object. <clears throat> so, and how do we do that? Well, from any code region to a big ugly lambda, and this is as far as I, I went for now. Uh, the key here is to pick a set of statement, extract a function, make the function static immutable. So that's kind of final in Java, although it's not that, that good. Uh, const in C++ is a much better uh, way. And then for each compilation error, we can replace the state with parameters, or we can extract another lambda. And then you, I do simplification of these things using currying functional composition or injecting lambdas into other lambdas. The interesting thing about this is I wrote tests on the code base in the beginning. And then I started to do these mechanical processes, which are extremely mechanical, actually. So it's, it's not a lot to think about. You just go and do little by little, little by little. And I ran the tests after a while. And everything was working, which is extremely surprising when you work with legacy code. Um, and that's why I think it's a promising technique. And what I ended up with, this is a an ugly lambda, um, and you can find the, the source code there. Um, and then its body looks something like that, so it actually calls the functions and so on. There's still some work to do here. And then a, an example of other uh, function, uh, other pure function, is, is this one, where um, I actually have to return two things to, to make it work. But the interesting discussion for me is, it seems that this has potential to be a method to safely refactor legacy code. Uh, but then what I would like to do is to turn it into something that's more closer to, to a proven method. Um, that would be a really good, a really cool idea. Um, and of course, it has to be simple enough to, to use with, with the IDEs we have. Um, I plan to do more work on this. This is as far as I went uh, right now, but it's a very promising thing. I want to work with, with more people to, to improve this. And now for something completely different. Uh, intersection number five, it's about engineering. There's one interesting thing. Uh, one of my pet peeves is I discuss with people that, you know, software is a craft and things like this, and they tell me about software is engineering. And then it took me a long time to figure out a good response for that. 
And my good response for that right now is maybe we should do what engineers do then. I'm perfectly fine with that. But there are many practices in engineering that we don't do, like uh, taking detailed notes uh, and uh, um, having a lot of thinking about the systems that we work with. Um, but one particular thing that works here is that's interesting is a built-in self-test. So if you don't know uh, maybe some of the devices that we have, they have actually this built-in system. You can turn your device into the, the self-test mode and then run the test and it will tell you, yeah, it's good or not. Yet, what we do in software is to separate the tests for the source code. And I think this is a, a problem that comes from our legacy. We kind of edit tests as a second thought later on. Um, and instead, I tried to experiment with something else, with self-testable programs. With a program that you can, for example, create user, you can run with a self-test parameter, and it will tell you, yeah, I'm working or not. Right now, so there are limitations to this, of course. What you can do is to write the unit tests, and you can have a few integration tests, maybe. But there is a challenge there in separating the production data from test data and so on. So there are a few challenges to, to work out. But the interesting thing later was, how about we make it self-contained? So not only test it, but there are many other things that I, I want the program to do. Uh, create its own initial database structure so that I can actually use it. Um, doing a backup, doing a restore, doing you know, setup. And of course, we can discuss about security. I haven't gotten into that. Uh, that's a completely different <laughs> conversation for now. But it's an interesting concept to, to look at. Uh, and it turns out that it's, it takes a bit of fiddling, but it's relatively easy to include the tests in your production code. Uh, you need to see how you initialize JUnit and things like that. But if you can do that, then it's, it's quite easy. And you have an example here. Now, what I think this might bring us is mostly psychological. Because if you think about this, your tests become part of your production code. <coughs> it's no longer a separate thing. We no longer discuss about having tests. Should I write the tests or not? Well, it's a requirement for your program. So, of course, you should. It's as simple as that. <coughs> and I think this might help us ease into uh, writing automated tests. And you also think about other requirements, which we, we usually forget, uh, operational things, right? We are developers, so we forget that somebody needs to monitor. Or That's my usual challenge with whenever I go in to do agile coaching is breaking these silos, making sure that we, we include everything. <clears throat> um, I mentioned this at the panel yesterday, so a sixth intercession, reaching out to scientists. Um, if you look at the science uh, studies that people do, especially with uh, test-driven development, with, they, they rarely have the results that I see as a professional. It's usually very different from my experience. And of course, maybe my experience is not uh, the normal developer experience. I can accept that. But I also need to question the, the method that we use in, uh, in science. Uh, because what I noticed by discussing with a few people from academia is that uh, you can, if you want to run experiments based on code and software development, you need to have access to code to people and so on. <laughs> and then where do you go? Either to large companies, to open source projects, or to undergraduates. 
and none of these represent, let's say, the average programming experience. So then, <coughs> what if we would solve this problem? Um, I know we don't want to expose the code, but what if we could expose anonymous data about the code? How many methods per class? How many classes per package? How many packages? Uh, how many lines per method? All kind of things like this without actually showing the names of the methods or any closed information. And I think this is a proposition that could easily be adopted by more companies. But uh, I have no idea how to write a CA plugin right now. <laughs> so that might be an interesting project to do. And the final one is an, uh, an extra, because it's nice to have seven things. So we have six intersection and one reflection about the fundamental nature of software development. I, th well, I thought a lot of in the past about why do, there were a lot of attempts at building visual programming languages that business people could use, right? Maybe some of you remember those. Uh, they never worked. And the question that always bugged me is why? What is this fundamental thing that separates programmers from business people that they cannot actually do this type of, of thing. And I think that um, I found the answer in that the fundamental difficulty of software development, the thing that we are best at solving, is taking very fuzzy requirements, very fuzzy needs and wants, and turning them into very precise code. Now, how we do that, the middle of it, Maybe we'll find other ways to build it. But this is a difficulty that will stay with us for a very long time. And I think this is why it takes a trained mind to do this type of things. Uh, when you talk to business, develop, to business people and you try to be more concrete about things, they usually get annoyed. So that's why you know, going into a programming language, as nice as it is with nice blocks and things like this, it probably won't work. But this took me into a, another realm where I imagined uh, an ideal machine that stands between our very clear, clearly defined specifications and the actual code. And I call that the ideal generative machine. It's inspired by the we already have the Turing machine. So. so imagine that instead of writing code, what you would write is very clear, very concrete specifications. And then you feed these to a kind of generative machine, and that machine creates the code, creates your application. Now, an interesting so let, let's ignore for now the impossibility of this. Right? And think about the possibilities. Uh, what happens if you forgot the requirement? You just go back at another requirement, feed the machine again, run it, it works. What happens if you have a design problem, rigidity and something like this? You don't care, you just go change a requirement, it creates your new code. So it's a, an idea interesting to explore. Um, and this is what I called in the, the abstract of this talk, you know, turning back time to, to figure out design mistakes, to solve your design mistakes. There is no more design mistakes if we would have this. Now I can go even further because there's been some interesting development in the area of test-driven development. What we know now is that we have the test-driven development cycles, and there is an interesting cycle between transform writing the code, writing the test, transformation in code, refactoring in code. Um, and I don't expect this to be fully 
automatable, that's why it's called an ideal machine. But it's, again, it's an idea that's interesting to, to ponder. And unless we get some very smart artificial intelligence that can write code for us, uh, maybe this is a way to, to move forward uh, in our industry. So I have no idea how this, how to even start working on something like this. It is, it's a fundamental idea. It's very difficult to, to think about, you know, a starting point. But maybe some of you will be inspired in exploring it. Um, okay. So what I hope to get out of this talk is that maybe you are inspired by some of these ideas. And I'm not looking to push these ideas to you, but what I'm looking is for you to look outside your, your domain and maybe find other people who are interested in the same things. And like we built, like we started the software development gang, maybe you can also start your work groups around things like, I don't know, maths or physics or biology or who the hell knows. Because I think it's a, it's a very good idea to, to raise the bar. Uh, and this is what raising the bar means to me. And of course, feel free to, to contact me if you have anything interesting. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, I think we might have time for a few questions. Okay, one here, the one there. It's a really interesting idea with um, generating code from requirements. Mm -hmm. However, uh, I think actually maybe it's from that 1968 paper, but there is this uh, <laughs> phrase saying that requirements, if they're precise enough, they're equivalent to a program. Yeah. So it's always there's always tension between engineers and um, business people asking for them to give like specify it more, but if we force them to specify it completely, then basically they did our job. We yeah. could then write a translator. Um, so <laughs> how do you turn this not into, into not into another kind of programming? Because if you make it too rigid, it's basically like a fourth generation programming language like SQL, where in yeah. effect you're kind of specifying what you want to get, but it's still so rigid that it's kind of programming. So the, the very straight answer is I have no idea. Uh, I mean, it can be that, of course, what I imagine is that I will have a kind of programming language to define the specifications, right? So th that's obviously uh, part of it. But um, if this is even remotely possible and what other problems it creates in while solving <laughs> some of the existing problems, we can only find those by actually experimenting with the idea. So, and I expect to find much more problems because, again, that's why I called it ideal. It's from ideal to real. It's a very different <laughs> perspective. But thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much.